Health emergencies of all kinds happen annually. Occasionally, an emerging infectious disease would shock our health system, examples of which include the Spanish influenza of 1918, the cholera outbreaks in tropics, the SARS, Ebola, Zika, dengue, measles, polio, and now we have COVID-19. For this episode, we will try and understand health emergencies with specific attention to outbreaks and epidemics and how the health system prepares and responds to such overload of the health system. This is Dr. Teddy Herbosa, your host for Health Issues here at TVUP. For this episode, our guest is a career official of the Department of Health. I met her in the early 90s in the original Disaster Management Unit, or DMU, of the Department of Health under the time of Secretary Bengson. She eventually became the Regional Director of Mimaropa, or Region 4A of the Department of Health, and of Region 5, Bicol Region of the Department of Health. She played major role in uh, eruptions of Mayon Volcano and typhoons that happened in the Bicol Region, and eventually played a vital role as our resource hub manager based in Samar during our response to the Typhoon Haiyan in 2013. Soon thereafter, she was rewarded a post as director of the Health Emergency Management Bureau at the Central Office of the Department of Health. Viewers, let's welcome Dr. Gloria Balboa to Health Issues to discuss emergency operation response operations in outbreaks and epidemics. Welcome, Glo. Good. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yusek Ted. Uh, he's my former boss here at the Department of Health. And uh, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. And hello to everyone watching. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Director Well, let's start off with uh, what is the DOH response plan for a pandemic or a, for, for, or a plan for emerging infectious diseases? Okay, actually we have a um, specific uh, bureau, that the Disease Prevention and Control Bureau, that has the uh, emerging and re-emerging disease uh, program. And uh, actually uh, they are really the ones in charge of pandemic uh, emergencies preparedness. But uh, since this is already an outbreak, so this is when our uh, the Health Emergency Management Bureau is coming in because this is already an event, an, a disaster event. So the coordinating function of the Health Emergency Management uh, uh, Bureau is there, okay? But of course, the data um, are, are supposed to be, uh, are provided by the Epidemiology Bureau. So they work hand in hand, the Epidemiology Bureau with, with the Disease Prevention and Control Bureau, and coming up with the policies, guidelines, the plans, and then the Health Emergency Management Bureau comes in to uh, sort of coordinate all these efforts that the Department of Health are doing. And in fact, the Health Emergency Management Bureau is the one sitting at the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council uh, of the Philippines. And now also sitting at the uh, National yes. Incident <laughs> Command Emergency Operations Center of the National Task Force. Yes. Correct. Yes. So, uh, I know for a fact that during our time, the Department of Health submitted a pandemic influenza preparedness plan to the World Health Organization. Can you tell us yes. more about this? Because I think you were a regional director then, so I'm sure you also had uh, yes. some inputs to that uh, pre pandemic preparedness plan. Okay. Yes. Uh, based on the... Uh, pandemic preparedness plan of the Department of Health, and actually it was uh, an option, option of a lot of uh, disasters or special epidemics that we have already experienced. No? Uh, and as you have uh, probably listened to uh, our plan during the start of this COVID-19, uh, we have, of course, first when uh, we had the uh, presence of the COVID virus in, in other parts of the country, like in China, that is our door one, okay? Correct. Where we would try to, um, try to really okay. limit the entrance mm -hmm. of this uh, uh, virus to the Philippines because it's still outside of the country. And then uh, we went into uh, door two when uh, we have already, uh, there are already cases that has uh, in our borders and has entered the Philippines. So Correct. we uh, were into that uh, door. And then door three, 
uh, is when uh, uh, you know we are trying to prevent the social uh, you know community community or local transmission. transmission okay and Correct. then when we already had the local transmission we went immediately into door four and this is uh, when it was just a cluster or uh, small patches of uh, areas having the uh, disease it's just the um, sub level one this is already mm -hmm. the code uh, red alert okay but sub level alert, one different yes and then when we had the sub level two this is when we already had local transmission in a lot of areas that is the uh, door for um, sub level two so that is uh, still code red but uh, already uh, sub level two okay so, so our that plan is how we prepared for it yes correct okay. The preparedness plan involved uh, by situating where the country is at particular levels of an outbreak yes. or a pandemic. Yes. So in that yes. case, we have a unit in the uh, Department of Health called the Epidemiology Bureau. Yes. They're the ones tasked to actually do the surveillance. Can you discuss yes. to our people how epidemiologic surveillance is done and what is the function of the Epidemiology Bureau? Okay. Uh the surveillance uh, bureau, uh, the surveillance activities of the epidemiology bureau is there actually even during normal situation wherein uh, they, we have the regional epidemiology surveillance unit at the regional level and then at the local levels, uh, provincial, municipal, city levels, we also have this epidemiology surveillance unit. Now, uh, they do this monitoring or surveillance of cases, especially the notifiable diseases. Okay, we have notifiable diseases. And when there is this increasing number of disease, number of that disease, then they would report it going up to the regional and then the epidemiology bureau so that uh, immediate intervention can be done uh, already and that is when they do epidemiologic investigation okay so this is to uh, really in institute uh, the necessary actions so that uh, the um, for it becoming an outbreak can be prevented okay so that is how we do it and uh, although of course there are some limitations because uh, not all are part of that surveillance uh, unit because uh, only hospitals identified as sentinel sites are included. Mm -hmm. So not all private hospitals are part of this sentinel surveillance system. That is why, you know, that is part of the limitation. But it's good so, that here, when we had this COVID-19, we have already included ev everybody, you know, all the mm -hmm. private hospitals, local government unit hospitals, and uh, of course the DOH hospitals are already part of this. And uh, we are doing this through our uh, data up, uh, data collect application in, because we already have this uh, you know, on mandatory reporting of notifiable diseases. So all Correct. the health facilities are expected to report already all notifiable diseases. Otherwise, uh, they will be, you know, there's sort of a penalty. Okay. Could you give us a list or name some of the top notifiable diseases that the Department of Health and the other uh, epidemiology surveillance units are monitoring or continually okay. uh, assessing? Yeah, what are the these diseases? Yes. Well, we have, of course, uh, HIV AIDS. Okay. Yes, HIV. We have, TB. Um, missiles, TB, uh, dengue, and dengue. Uh, cholera, cholera, and uh, yeah, a lot more. Okay, those Love which more. are of public health emergencies. And then it's another unit that looks at the emerging and uh, re-emerging, right? We yes. have polio, right? We were not monitoring polio before, but suddenly ah, we had yeah. an outbreak. So now yes. polio, polio is being monitored, correct? Yes, yes. So it has. So that's what we call a re-emerging. Re 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 yes. So this it one, the be. COVID is in emerging, emerging. Infectious disease. yes so yes. it's a new it's a novel virus we had sars which was similar to it and remember during our time we had mers cov yeah. during that time from the yes. middle east uh, these yeah. are what we call the emerging these are the new yes. new yes. diseases and we monitor them uh Glo, you need to describe to our televiewers when do you say there is an outbreak of these diseases if we monitor these okay. diseases for you all year round uh dengue yes. TB, hiv when do we say there is an outbreak of measles? When do we say there is an oh. outbreak of dengue? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. It's not that 
is it to declare, declare an outbreak? No, that is why we really need uh, the technical, uh, the experts to do that. But uh, basically when we say there's an outbreak is when the number of cases have uh, increased uh, beyond uh, the the usual, meaning to say uh, we uh, have to look at the past five, at least five years incidence of that particular disease. Uh, this is if it is uh, an old disease, okay? So for the last five years, you have to look at the, the average or the number of cases. And then when suddenly there's an spike or an increase, uh, at yeah. least half, no more than half of that, uh, the previous incidence, then we can say that there is an outbreak. But for new diseases like COVID, when it's not there, uh, it's never before. Never not there before. Yeah. Before, mm. so even just one case would really uh, fit the definition already of an outbreak. That is why it, when we had the first case uh, that was March of uh, of COVID nineteen, because we are already monitoring it because it's in other countries. So the moment that we had that first case, then first we possible. declared already that there's an outbreak. Yes. There's a, the so we become days. part of the countries with a COVID yes. outbreak. Yes. So we're more part of the pandemic. That's yes. correct. So can you can you tell me? Uh, you mentioned it a while ago that uh, different levels of government have what is called the ESU or the Epidemiologic Surveillance Unit. Yes. You, yes. you have the CESU, the RESU, the yes. PESU. Uh, so <laughs> uh, can you explain this network? Because these are our I call them our disease detectives because every time I visit them, e, they are like detectives. Okay. They have on the wall the, the contact yes. cases. They are the ones that do uh, contact tracing. Is that correct? Yes. 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 So can you explain okay. the SU, ESUs? <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, well, we have two levels, national and the local level. So uh, the first national is the epidemiology bureau and then the regional, which is also part of the national uh, surveillance unit uh, because the, we are on a devolved setup, right? So and the national yes. DOH is up to the regional level, okay? Correct. And then the provincial down to the municipal and city levels, so these are provin our local epidemiology surveillance units. Okay, what does this uh, unit do? Uh, first is when, uh, of course, this is surveillance. They are the ones really monitoring the incidence of diseases in this different, uh, in the different sentinel sites. Okay, and then once there is uh, uh, an increasing number of uh, cases, then they would do uh, epidemiologic investigation. So they are the ones, like detectives, as you have said, no? uh, going to that area where there are uh, increasing number of cases to really do uh, this epidemiologic investigation. They try to uh, see where are the cases, what are the causes, and the signs and symptoms, and, and then they try to really uh, look at the source of that particular mm -hmm. infection, and then, uh, of course, there are tests that needs to be done. Then once uh, the test would show that it's positive, then they would do contact tracing of these positive cases. Ayon. So uh, the close contacts will have to be um, investigated and then their contacts also so that preventive measures can already be done. Like if there are uh, things that the, that particular contacts need to do, or like for example, if it can be prevented by immunization, then immunization will have to be done. And if Correct. it's already a lot of uh, um, a significant number in a particular area, then mass immunization can be done. Okay, but these are for uh, diseases uh, that can be prevented by immunization. Yeah, so that's we have a uh, vaccine available. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. But uh, we also find the source, right? For example, I remember. In yes, Japan, of course. The, the source cholera, is very. The yeah. source was a piggery linked to a yeah. uh, to the river, wherein the waste of the piggery was going into the river yeah. and was uh, contaminating the the water sources of all the communities down yes. downstream. So yes. that's one of the. The other thing that I noticed uh, in the current situation that's a lot of confusion is the term quarantine and isolation. Can you okay. differentiate the two terms? What is a quarantine yeah. done for and what okay. is an isolation uh, done yes. for? Okay, uh, based on the guidelines uh, that the Department of Health released, I don't remember the uh, number of that uh, department memorandum, no? but uh, they tried 
uh, to differentiate between the quarantine and the isolation. Uh, when I say quarantine, uh, this would uh, mean um, putting in areas those who are close contacts, okay, so, and the uh, those who are suspects and probable cases. So these are not yet positive, okay? Mm -hmm. And so they are put in a quarantine facility to limit uh, the, the potential for them to be able to spread the disease because we still don't know whether right. they are positive or negative. And so, uh, and, and the, the design for that quarantine facility is such that they are uh, put in one room each, okay? Because yes. we don't want to, you know, um, them to, to be mingling with others, no. okay? So that is uh, what we call a quarantine facility. You prevent them from moving around so that, you know, uh, even if you are not sure yet if they're positive or negative, but well, if they are positive, then you could limit the transmission, okay? So that's a uh, quarantine facility. But for the isolation, these are already the positive cases. Since they're already positive, uh, the design of that isolation uh, facility is such that they can be cohorted already. No, it doesn't, uh, they don't have to be in one a room with their own uh, comfort rooms, but uh, they can, for as long as they have this uh, two, at least two meters uh, distance between two beds, so cohorting na pwede. That is why pwede sa ward, in the hospital ward, or in a gym, where it has just have to be designed such that, you know, we still limit the, the transmission. But since they're all positive already, then they can be cohorted. So yun yun, quarantine, di pa siya positive, yeah. isolate those positive ones. And so, uh, Glow, we also use quarantine for people that come in from outside the country, right? So can you yes. explain that procedure? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, first, if they're coming from countries, especially uh, in countries where there is local transmission, okay, so we really uh, would want uh, that when we receive them, they are not symptomatic, okay, and they are negative. That is why right. the, the procedure is that they should be tested uh, when they're still in their country and they're supposed to have a negative test. But, you know, of course, because of the um, this scarcity already uh, of, of uh, the test kits, because globally we have shortage of the shortage. test kits, no? So if they have not been uh, tested yet, then uh, they should be asymptomatic, okay? So if they, once they, uh, when they board the plane, they have to be checked, no? Of course, the usual BOQ procedures. Uh, those who are as asymptomatic will be allowed to board. Those symptomatic should not be allowed to board. Should not be allowed to board. And then uh, upon arrival in the country again, they will be uh, tested by the Bureau of Quarantine, thermal scanning, and uh, signing the health declaration card. And those, again, asymptomatic uh, will be brought to a quarantine facility because quarantine they will facility. have to undergo 14 day quarantine because they have not yes. been tested. There. Okay. And then, but for those who are symptomatic, they will be brought directly to a hospital, okay? Because right. we don't have to meet them to those who we are... We isolate them. Those yes, that are isolate. isolate. Yes, them. yes. So, so Glo, can you, you, told, you said it's a 14-day quarantine. Uh, I remember yeah. during the Ebola, we had the soldiers from West Africa, and we quarantined them in an island, Caballo Island, but it was 21 days. So can you explain the difference in days? Why in okay. Ebola it was 21, and mm -hmm. why for COVID we use 14 mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that the the fourteen days or the twenty ones would refer to the incubation period, wherein uh, within that period, uh, that's the time that you are supposed to um, present signs and symptoms. Okay, so uh, th after that, if you don't show signs and symptoms, then you are presumed to have not contracted or the disease. Okay, so yun po yun. And since these are different um, different vi viruses, they have different incubation period. Okay, so yun nga, yung sa Ebola, I said it's, it's uh, 21 days, but for COVID, based on studies, it's 14 days. Although, of course, we know that there are some that are extending uh, beyond 14 days, but majority, it's really 14 days. So yun po yung, uh, that's a basis for our quarantine period. So it now becomes clear how the Epidemiology Bureau, the mm -hmm. Epidemiologic Surveillance Unit, quarantines, isolate, contact trace. 
Now, tell me more about the Health Emergency Management Bureau. What is the HEMB? What is HEMB <laughs> of the Department of okay. Health? Okay, yes. Uh, well, I mentioned that uh, the Health Emergency Management Bureau is the bureau within the Department of Health that coordinates all the emergency and disaster um, management operations uh, in the country. You know? And this, uh, when we say health uh, emergencies and disasters, so this would refer to uh, the, the natural, the human induced, and even outbreaks. Okay? So yes. uh, that is why we're here. Um, MB is supposed to be the repository of all this um, information about uh, any health emergency and disaster. And ayun nga, we are very strong in coordinating all these responses yes. no? because we have to manage from the prevention, mitigation, preparedness uh, phase to response and then up to the recovery rehabilitation. So we cover the entire management cycle. And then when before it's more of the responses are more on uh, the, the actual response but now we are more uh, proactive because that's why uh, disaster risk reduction we changed the the name even the national disaster risk reduction management council because we want to focus more on the uh, pre disaster uh, activities uh, so that we can prepare better to respond so it's not just responding, no, but really preparing for it, uh, which is right. a lot, lot more job. Okay. So now that you're here at the National uh, Incident Command Center, Emergency Operations Center, representing USEC Bayugo and Secretary Duque in this uh, multi-agency operation, can you kind of summarize what uh, DOH, Department of Health, has accomplished so far in the response operations task group? of uh, COVID-19. Okay. Okay. Yes, uh, the task group response operation is one of the four task groups under the national task force. No? So the other three would be the uh, task group, uh, this resource management and logistics, and then Stratcom, and then the food, uh, food security. Okay, so since this is a, a health event, so the task group response operation uh, is he headed by the Department yeah. of Health, and in fact, it is the, a major task group uh, of yes. among the, the four task groups. It is a major task group because all the others would really depend on the task group response operations. Correct. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we are uh, in our action plan, national action plan, specific for the task group response operation, we have uh, when before it's just we detect, isolate, treat. Now it has evolved into prevent, okay, uh, detect, detect, isolate, test, treat, yes. and then reintegrate. Okay, and this yes. is going to the new normal. So the different activities that we're doing are based on this uh, strategies. No, so when we say prevent. Of course, uh, we have there the different uh, precautionary measures that need to be done by the community, you know, the individuals, uh, you know, social distancing, well, hand, yeah, washing, hand washing, hand okay, the face mask, the mask, okay, and then really uh, there's at a home, lot staying. of, yeah, staying at home, of course, and then there's a lot of uh, information dissemination that really yes. needs to be done, okay. And then crisis for the communication, detect, yes. Uh -huh. Yes, especially crisis communication. And then for the detect, uh, the main activity that we're doing here is contact tracing. Okay, and yes. when it when before it's just our RESU, which is national the scope, uh, because of the uh, increasing then well, we have a lot of cases already, so we need to do contact tracing uh, by the local epidemiology surveillance uh, units. Okay, so uh, sila na po ang uh, contact tracing and uh, we have been hiring, we have hired uh, additional contact tracers and then uh, involving the different agencies, especially in the local government units, to be doing the contact tracing you know, headed by our lessons. Okay. And, uh, and the DILG, uh, yeah, right? The yes, DILG is really, uh, yeah, it's uh, headed by uh, DILG because the task group response operation, yeah, it's headed by the Department of Health, but the secretariat is DILG and they're really doing uh, a lot of job, a great job. Yes. And the other members, 
A, uh, yung AFP, PNP, uh, um, Coast Guard, Navy, Red Cross is also our partner or a member of this task group. Okay, and then going back, okay, detect, uh, basically it's more on contact tracing and then isolate. This is when we, once we're able to uh, uh, trace the close contacts, then we, uh, we put them in a quarantine facility, okay? Um, close contacts and then if they are asymptomatics, no? And, but for the symptomatics, they're classified further into the suspect and the probable cases because these yes. are not tested yet. Okay, so after that, then uh, once they are in a quarantine facility, we do the testing because, mm -hmm. well, we cannot test them immediately, no? So we put them first in a quarantine facility and then we test and then because the result would take about uh, three uh, days before we get the result, then uh, they would stay first in the quarantine facility. Once they are tested positive, then we treat them. Okay, we put them in the isolation facility for the uh, positive, asymptomatic, and mild. But those who are severe and critical cases uh, would be put in the hospitals. Okay, so in uh, because they would be needing, you know, uh, they have to be in isolation units, uh, intensive care units, and maybe they would be needing these ventilators, no? because uh, it, this would really affect the respiratory system and a lot are dying because of pneumonia as a complication of this uh, COVID-19. Okay, so there uh, they undergo the treatment and hopefully when they uh, get well, then they are reintegrated into the uh, community. You know? uh, in fact, if they do not, uh, after, after treatment, if they're uh, tested already negative, no? Once they're positive and then uh, if they are uh, getting well, they are tested again. Only when they are tested negative can they be brought back to the community. Now, if they have not completed the, the 14 days in the hospital because they're uh, relatively well, then they are allowed to go home if they are negative already, but they have to complete their 14 days warrant, uh, isolation in, the, in their home. <laughs> Uh, sorry, it's quarantine. They have to do home quarantine to complete their 14 day uh, uh, quarantine at home. And of course, there are guidelines that need to be passed. So, ayun po. And then, uh, of course, they have to still practice the usual precautionary measures so that they don't, uh, of course, uh, for everybody to be protected. Okay. The other thing that the uh, Department of Health has done very well is that you have increased the number of tests per day. I remember we started with only three test centers, but uh, today we have about 26. Can you talk about 30, the different testing? Yeah. 30. Can you talk about we the different 30 testing already. centers? Okay. Can yes. you describe uh, the efforts in increasing our capacity for testing? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Initially, it's just uh, RITM, the Research Institute yes. Tropical Medicine, uh, that is doing the test. Uh, and then we have uh, five additional uh, sub-national uh, testing laboratories. So they're strategically located in uh, Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao, and then in NCR. Okay, and then because of the need to have more testing uh, laboratories, then we have opened it to even private hospitals. Uh, well, there are stages of the accreditation process. There are five stages. Uh, first stage is the um, submission of a self-assessment uh, form so that they would know what they need to prepare to be able to become uh, a laboratory testing facility. And then uh, once they have complied, uh, they go to stage two validation. That is when uh, DOH uh, regulatory people would go visit the testing laboratory to see if uh, they have you know, they're ready. And if they see that there are some deficiencies, then they have to comply. So that's going to the stage three. And then uh, they have to comply in terms of the equipment, of the, the environment there. And then, of course, when you speak of uh, equipment, PCR machine, and very important, which is quite difficult uh, for a lot, yung biosafety uh, cabinet. Uh, standards, uh, like, yeah, biosafety. Yeah, cabinet, aside from expensive, no, it's really uh, difficult 
apply and then uh, but once these are in place already then that's the time they go into the next stage which is the profession proficiency not proficiency stage where the the personnel you know, because this is a new uh, technology so uh, not any med tech or uh, health professional can just do it so they still need to be uh, trained on how to do it and then ion so once they pass the proficiency test then they become uh, uh, they are accredited they're issued that accreditation and they can now operate as testing laboratory so we are very happy because uh, from that time um, February we only have one and then uh, six and then now we have uh, 30. 30 okay we have now wow. 30 and Marikina is already accredited Yes, they yes, Marikina. Nali, passed, yes. passed the proficiency. Yes. I heard they had difficulties yes. with the <laughs> and proficiency stage. Cross. Okay, yeah. Also, Red Cross. Red Cross yes. And of course, UP, UP and NIH. UP, NIH, so, UP, PGC, and UP, yes. PGH. We have yes. three testing then, centers. At the yes, time. and then we had this one, GBL, uh, which was uh -huh. inaugurated. GBL, uh, uh, Jose, Jose Bilingan. Yes, and the, uh, this In was... Assisted by ADB, okay, Asian the Development. Of the Asian Fund. Development Fund. Yeah. Yes, it was, I think grant. a modular lab that was flown in. Yes. And it's attached nice. to the hospital. Yeah, it was inaugurated last Saturday, and they're already uh, uh, operating, and they can do as much as uh, about ten thousand a day tests. Okay, right. that would. I be think there are also other uh, resources that are available soon, like the. Uh, Gene expert, the one being yes. used for the TB program. Can you tell us about that? Yes, okay. Yes, uh, I should mention this uh, gene experts are used for the TB program. And then uh, it was found out that it, they could also be used uh, for uh, COVID 19. But uh, there's this special cartridge for that. And then, so right now, uh, we have two um, gene experts laboratories accredited already. One is Lung Center, and then the other one is Sambuanga uh, City Medical Center with DA, Department of Agriculture. What is good there is they complemented each other, you know, mm -hmm. so they were able to have that uh, accredited as a, a gene expert laboratory. And then we have uh, 14 more uh, to be uh, for, you know, in the process of uh, accreditation. Approval. Yes, a government. As a total of 16 yen in government, and then three private gene expert laboratories. So they're all so, into this process of accreditation. So yeah. by the end of uh, May, probably we will have more than 50 testing centers, including the gene experts, correct? Mm. That's the target. Yes. And how yes. many tests will be doing a day by that time uh, when all these are functional? Uh, so both the, the testing lab and the gene experts. Correct. Okay. Well, initially, uh, we have targeted the 8,000. We're ngayon, na tayo. We are over 8,637 8, tests uh, yeah, yesterday. Yesterday. Okay. yesterday. And then, but of course, that is not enough. So, uh, from 8,000, we're targeting 10,000, and then 20, and then hopefully 30,000 a day. 30,000 a day. Yes. So that yes. we can test Anna. the population and have a more accurate uh, uh, picture yes. of COVID 19. In the Yes. Paul. Well, okay. last question for you, uh, Director Barboa, before I let you go because of your busy schedule. Any other issues, major issues and concerns in the operations, in the response operations for COVID-19 that you'd like to discuss? Okay. Well, of course, the issue on the availability of logistics would always be there because there is this global shortage. Okay? So that mm -hmm. is something that is, you know, uh, quite be on our control then. No, okay. Correct, but of correct. course, we're doing our best. Okay. Uh, we are also um, having some locally produced, you know, like for example, the PPEs, okay, and uh, the other supplies. So that's one. And then uh, one big issue also is on repatriation. Okay. Yeah, because that's a major a issue. Lot, yes, yes. There are a lot uh, of Filipinos uh, that are being repatriated. And in fact, Sabina is. 100,000 or even more. Correct. <laughs> so I, I believe see, there are now 20, oh, how many thousand? 20,000. Uh, 20, almost 25,000 were that already came in here. already. Uh -huh. Yes. And they okay. filled up our quarantine facilities. Our, yes. Uh, what I thought were very huge mega quarantine facilities became filled up <laughs> yes. in an instant and we had to stop yes. the airplanes 
uh, yes. flying them in for a week, right? So now they're coming yes. back. Okay. We will be having more of them for the coming weeks, right? Yes, so yeah, that's a good move by the government uh, uh, suspending uh, for quite a time the uh, repatriation uh, so that we can, um, you know, let this, uh, those who are already here, you know, occupying already all our uh, quarantine facilities to be able to go home. And that is after they tested positive with PCR test, you no? Know, because, uh, you know, uh, even the LGUs, of course, they, would want, they don't want to accept them if they are not yet tested. So we have to test them all and then hopefully they can go home even if they don't uh, finish yet the 14 days quarantine. And then uh, we are again accepting uh, uh, repatriation but uh, on sort of a controlled, uh, controlled. You know, number. Yes, controlled number. Okay, so yun po, but of course, since there are a lot, so we need so many, okay, swabbers to test them, no? See, mega swab centers are being set yes, up, Yes, right? yeah, so we have four mega swabbing centers, okay, and uh, yeah, it's, two are working already, and uh, yun nga, malaking bagay yun. So there are already those who are able to go home, no? And of course, we have to uh, involve a lot of agencies here. Uh, ang, I'm in charge of the Coast Guard, but of course, uh, OWA, uh, DFA, uh, POEA, of course, DOH and DOTR, because they are the ones providing the transportation for this, so are going home. And we have to make sure that uh, with the assistance of the ILG, PNP, that uh, they have a smooth travel going uh, back to their uh, provinces and that they are really accepted by uh, by their uh, respective local government units. And yun nga, uh, with the pronouncement of our president saying that the LGUs cannot refuse <laughs> them no? because yes. they are going home. Uh, so there are just these requirements nga na ayun, there should be this medical clearance uh, from the quarantine facility manager uh, that they are have completed their uh, quarantine period or if not at least they are tested positive no I no sorry negative they have undergone the PCR test and showing that they are negative so even if in the completo yung 14 days uh, they can be allowed to go home and then of course they have to get a travel authority from our joint task force uh, shield uh, so that you know they're going back home would be smooth at makarating ng <laughs> maaga. Okay, so yes. yun. And that process would really uh, require a lot of people, a lot of procedures. So yun po yung ating pinagkakabalan din. Okay? Well, Director Glow, uh, on behalf of the Filipino people, I'd like to thank you for your dedicated service in the field of disaster medicine and now in the, this pandemic that we are actually having. Maraming maraming salamat. I, I hope you do stay safe and be healthy yeah. to lead the Department of Health in its response operations. Maraming maraming salamat. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. And thank you for, it's my pleasure to be part of this program. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, we've seen how the Department of Health uh, organizes itself in an epidemic. We have several units, the Epidemiology Bureau, the Epidemiologic Surveillance Units, the HEMB, the Health Emergency Management Bureau, and all assets of the Department of Health are used to actually fight and combat the new, new epidemic or the new pandemic called COVID-19. Uh, we welcome the efforts of the Department of Health in trying to save the Filipino people, and we do hope that everyone cooperates, stays home, and stays safe. Maraming salamat po. This is your host, Dr. Teddy Herbosa of Health Issues here at PVUP.